Good morning. I'm Dave Cook, your service coordinator for today. Our minister, the Reverend Dr. Leon Dunkley, is on sabbatical until April. In this hour and in this place, we cross a threshold from our day-to-day -day everydayness into space and time attuned to the other, to the sacred, to the holy, in an awareness of new life pregnant with possibilities. How will we be renewed at this moment? How will we be changed by this hour? How will we be transformed through this gathering of beloved community? Come, let us worship together. Those are words of Arlen Goff. If you're new to North Chapel, welcome. If you're visiting, please consider signing the guest book at the bank back of the sanctuary. We have hearing assistance devices and large print versions of the hymns on the back table should you need them. Tatum Barnes will be leading spiritual exploration this Sunday. After the service, we invite you to visit with each other. You can join us for coffee in the social hour and the social hall where masks are optional, though as a precaution, we request that you wash your own cup and utensils. Or you can mingle in the sanctuary. You'll find announcements in the order of service. And I have a special announcement that the Spring Fling Auction Item Submission Form, which looks like this, is available on the back table. So if you have something that you want to submit for the auction in the spring, use this form to let people know what it is. Now is the time to put your cell phone in worship mode. Thresholds. We cross them every day, from room to room, from outside to inside and back again, from world to world, from age to age. Each threshold offers an opportunity for change, for renewal, for transformation, from what we were and what we are to what we can be. It seems to me that some thresholds can also present a threat, a danger, that in crossing such a threshold, one must protect oneself, adapt, learn, submit, struggle, persevere, survive. These words are from Maggie Smith. You want a door you can be on both sides of it once. You want to be on both sides of here and there, now and then, together and, what did we call the life we would wish back? The old life? The before? Alone. But any open space may be a threshold, an arch of entering and leaving. Crossing a field, wading through nothing but Timothy grass. Imagine yourself passing from and into, passing through doorway after doorway after doorway.
my pleasure to introduce to you Sue Buckholz, who will give today's reflection on how we as a nation care for and support those in prison. Sue has been active for many years working with incarcerated people. Good morning. I want to read you a little piece um, that I hope will set the stage for what I hope we're going to be thinking about. It's called The Singularity by Marie Howe. Do any of you know it? <sighs> Do you sometimes want to wake up to the singularity, singularity we once were? So compact, nobody needed a bed or food or money. Nobody hiding in the school bathroom or home alone, pulling open the drawer where the pills are kept. For every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. Remember? There was no nature, no them, no tests to determine if the elephant grieves her calf or if the coral reef feels pain. Trashed oceans don't speak English or Farsi or French. Would that we could wake up to what we were when we were ocean, and before that to when sky was earth and animal was energy and rock was liquid and stars were space and space was not at all, nothing. Before we came to believe humans were so important, before this awful loneliness. Can molecules recall it? What once was before anything happened? No I, no we, no one, no was, no verb, no noun, only a tiny, tiny dot brimming with is, 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 is. Everything, all, home. So it's more than a couple months ago, but when I first wrote this piece, it was a couple months ago, I picked up one of my grandsons from school and brought him to the office until one of his other adults could take him home. While he was there, he asked me, apropos of nothing we've been talking about, whether I'd ever been in a prison. And I said, well, what I did not tell him was that I was briefly detained at the Lake Magnolia home for wayward girls and boys outside of Tampa, Florida, for being a runaway from New Haven, Connecticut, and a person under 17 out after 11 p.m. without someone over 21. But maybe in another 10 years, we'll have that conversation. <laughs> what I did tell him was that I had been in every prison in Vermont more than once, and a couple in other states as well. And he was stunned by this. And he asked me why, and I told him about working for the prisoner's rights office at the Vermont Defender General's office before he was born, because I think grandparents have to say that at least once a week, right, to remind us and them. And that part of the job was to go to each facility once a month to talk with the inmates and find out how things were going and what they needed. He was taken aback by this notion and asked, why do we care what they need? And there were two immediate, slightly oppositional thoughts in my head. How can it be we share so much DNA and you're asking me this question? <laughs> and the other one was, how have we not communicated to him why this is important? So uh, holding my best poker face, I told him I was very sure that I never wanted to be judged for the rest of my life for the worst thing I've ever done. And I was sure he wouldn't either. So why would we do this to the people who are in jail? Then I told him about Shovel, a mountain of a man who'd been in prisons for years and was not likely to ever get out, and how he was having a lot of trouble getting boots to fit his size 16 feet so he could do the work he was supposed to do at the prison. And my boy asked why I called him Shovel. So we talked about how Mr. Shovel had had a large love for drugs and alcohol in his youth and not for pretty much anything else, which helped him to make really bad decisions like taking a shovel and beating someone to death with it. And about what a different guy shovel was without the drugs and alcohol, 
but most people will never know him now because he's in prison for life or very close to it. There's very little incentive for many of us to deliver the message about Shovel and his compadres to our children, as our cultural ge culture generally continues to put punishment in front of any sort of real rehabilitation. Now, I've worked around DOC for a lot of years, not so much lately, and I do have issues with some DOC policy, and hands down, I have the most difficulty with the idea of sending prisoners miles from their homes to serve sentences where they know no one and where they will not be released so any positive relationships they might build while they're in Mississippi. When I was first talking with Kathy, I kept saying Alabama, and I knew it wasn't Alabama, so I want to thank her for correcting me on that. But those relationships, if they can form them, are not going to be useful when they finally do walk out of the prison. And Vermont started down that path in 1998 when I was a staff attorney there. And th that year we elected to outsource prisoners to other states to serve the bulk of their sentences. Initially, contracts were made with New Jersey and Virginia, you know, states that are not so far away, so there was still some possibility that kids could get to see their parent who had been sent out of state. And for a while there were buses and coordinations. <coughs> but we currently outsource prisoners to Mississippi, and that's consistent with the original program parameters, as DOC refused from the start to consider the impact on the minor offspring of those inmates, inmates who were deprived of any relationship with their incarcerated parent because of the long distance. And I don't wanna get into how many of those kids I then saw in juvenile court <laughs> because they were angry, among other things, about not having mostly dads. I don't think we've outsourced women yet. We haven't done that. Vermont has held more than 100 people at Tallahatchie County Correctional Facility in Mississippi, more or less consistent, consistently since 2018. And recently we renewed the contract and upped the number of beds for Vermonters by 20. But it appeared from what I was reading that we purchased enough beds to house 300 inmates, so I worry that there's another plan afoot. Um, Core Civic, the largest private prison company in the country, was the sole bidder for the contract. As of 2016, Core Civic managed more than 65 state and federal correctional and detention facilities with a capacity of more than 90,000 beds in 19 states and the District of Columbia. The current two-year contract with two additional one-year extensions sets a maximum cost of $21 million $463.95 for 300 beds. I don't know what the difference is between what it costs us to keep them here. It's a big number though. <laughs> According to the news released by Vermont DOC at the time, half of those spaces could be used for incarcerated people who need treatment for opioid addiction. Now an inmate with minor children who's housed in Vermont and thus gets to see their children might have a powerful disincentive to get into drug treatment in Mississippi if that contact would be lost. Conversely, DOC could use the move to Mississippi as a punishment for an inmate for unacceptable behaviors who would then lose contact with their children. The last time I looked, there were three wrongful death suits against Core Civic for three deaths that arguably should have been avoided, including one where the inmate was found dead from a fentanyl overdose in his cell. So there's a lot of questions there. Why was the inmate left alone long enough to fix up and die? What kind of fentanyl treatment are we providing if people are using fentanyl in their cells? In 25 years since the state began that practice, the overall prison population has declined. There are approximately 260 fewer people incarcerated Vermont, in Vermont by Vermont than there were in 2020, according to the department's data. And it takes you about 10 seconds to find Core Civic on internet lists of corporate misbehaviors led by treatment, mistreatment of inmates and staff. In 2020 alone, Core Civic was sued by employees for various wage and hour violations, costing the company $3.2 million in penalties alone. I, I can't even wrap my mind around how we're sending our inmates to people who commit um, money crimes every day against their own employees. 
it, it's, it's like something out of a Monty Python skit. But here we are. There are so many reasons why we have corrections departments in every state. My favorite being that as long as the state is running corrections, we have no excuse to blame unspecified others when things go wrong for inmates. It reminds us in a tangible way that all this is done in our name. And all this is done on our watch, no matter who is technically in charge of our inmate population. I've tried for a very long time to get my head around a conceptual framework whereby we send people to prison for having committed a crime or crimes, where we then allow the folks in charge of their care the latitude to perpetrate crimes against the inmates and their employees. On a good day, it's a little funny, but it's really not. There are many caring, remarkable people who work for corrections in Vermont and in other states. I'm sure they have counterparts in every state in the union, and make no mistake, there are crimes committed every day in prisons and not always committed by the inmates. One of the more disturbing issues, at least to me, arose when I was at Prisoners' Rights. The Vermont legislature introduced for the first time that I know of a bill to make any sexual contact between prison personnel and inmates an assault due to the inherent power imbalance in such facilities between those two groups. Initially, at the office, we thought this was a great idea. Then we heard from the women inmates in Chittenden. They asked for a meeting with us as their attorneys. Some of them were very upset. They told us that their only currency for obtaining sanitary products and other basic commodities was the very subject of the litigation. They had no money and very limited, if any, financial support from their families or friends. It was probably the hardest meeting I have been in in my legal career. Thinking about how, how was I gonna go in and argue against protecting them when it was their only option for soap and shampoo? Like, who are we that that's where that was at? And, I was really unsettled. <laughs> um, and I was relieved when the legislation failed because I just, I didn't know how I was gonna go in and make that argument. And we all have to do that on behalf of clients sometimes. And the legislation did pass in 2005. And it's on the books. And I know at least one case where someone was prosecuted. I don't hear about them very much, but. Sometimes I can't read what I wrote. <laughs> Difficult. So I think, you know, there are options around. I, we never had much, um, didn't make much progress trying to fight with DOC structure, but we have options around for people who are really trying to work with inmates and make their lives better. Dismiss, do we know about Dismiss? Yes. Dismiss. Great group. Um, and I think we're really lucky to have one in this area. So people who are getting out of jail and their families are here get to come and live near them. Safe haven for folks coming out of prison and attempting to adapt to normal life, whatever that is. The houses in Hartford Village, there's many ways to help. And my favorite one is make dinner and go and hang out with the guys. And it's really great. They like it. They're happy to be treated like normal people, which they're not getting all the time out on the street. I, I was on their board for years. I'm not anymore, but um, I still like to make dinner. And go to the, the ACLU in Vermont also started a program in 2018 called Smart Justice Vermont, which works on alternatives to incarceration to reduce the overall incarcerated population, principally through the legislative process. They have two stated goals reduce Vermont's prison population by at least half from its peak, and combat racial disparities in the criminal legal system. The ACLU reckons that since its inception in 2018, this project contributed to a 40% decrease in the state prison population through policy reforms, impactful legislation, and voter education efforts. 
as astutely stated in their webpage for this project, we have both the opportunity and a responsibility to eliminate our over-reliance on incarceration and address underlying disparities at every point in the system, from someone's first interaction with law enforcement to when they return to their community. Clearly, I do not have answers, and our lack of real answers leaves so many of us vulnerable. I know fewer and fewer people who are not connected to and who, or, and who love someone with an opioid addiction. The war on drugs is in many ways a war of attrition, as every week we lose more persons to overdose. Our family lost two last year. I don't have answers. I am fairly certain that what we've been doing is not saving our children, some of whom are the parents of our grandchildren. I invite each of us to figure out how we can help and then fight like hell for the living, as Mother Jones taught us those many years ago. Thank you. May we all remember how fortunate we are compared to many others in our community, in our country, and around the world. I hope you all have a fortunate week. Until next Sunday, blessed be and amen.